before we uh, jump in, I just have one logistics note. We do welcome questions from the audience. Um, if you do have a question, you'll see that there's an option on the event page to submit one. Please just put your questions in there um, and my colleagues will be looking at them and we'll, I'll do my best to uh, incorporate them if they're in the same stream as the direction of the conversation at the time. So digging right in, um, you're here to hear from this esteemed panel of experts. I thought I could start by looking at the state of play in EU debate on China um, and Noah first and then maybe Liana. As we conclude 2022, I think observers of the EU China relationship are left with some questions around where this relationship stands, whether and how, for example, the site and vend it um, in Europe's foreign and security policy comes with implications not just for Europe's approach to Russia, but also for its approach to China. Can you give us your sense of how um, European assessments of China as a rival, competitor and partner have developed over the past year and what have been some of the major turning points? So we'll start with Noah um, and then go to Liana. Uh, well, thanks, Lily, and thanks, Max. Good to see uh, all of you, Liana, Mathieu and, and Miko. Um, yeah, I think, uh, uh, does the site and vendor apply to China? I, I think it, it really depends on who you ask here in Berlin at the moment. We've had two leaked uh, papers from the German Foreign Ministry and the German Economy Ministry over the past weeks. Uh, and they, uh, if, if you look at them, they're calling for a pretty fundamental reassessment of the, uh, of the relationship with China. Uh, and, and I think they frame the, the conflict in Ukraine as a broader uh, lesson for German and, and European policymakers, essentially in two ways. One, one should not assume uh, that, uh, a, uh, that a conflict can't or won't happen because of our interpretation of what a foreign leader like Putin or Xi, uh, uh, a, yeah, what, what his interests are. Uh, and 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 two, um, one should be very careful about uh, building up economic dependencies on a, a geopolitical competitor or rival. Uh, so that's one part of the German government. If you if you talk to people in the, in the chancellery, you probably uh, get a a different response. Um, this morning, I printed out uh, uh, Olaf Scholz's article in foreign affairs. Uh, it was 19 pages long uh, on my printer. Uh, China is mentioned 11 times. Uh, Russia is mentioned 45 times. The China section starts on page 14 of 19 uh, and is just one page long. Uh, and China and Russia are not mentioned in the same sentence once. Uh, so, uh, so you see the, the differences uh, here within, within the government in Berlin. Germany is coming out with a national security strategy in the first quarter of next year. Uh, this is going to have to bridge the gap somehow within the government. Uh, so it would be interesting to see in that, in that how Russia and China uh, are uh, described. I, I think the fundamental question that uh, Germany faces at the moment, given the economic uh, uh, blows that it is uh, suffering uh, as a result of the war in Ukraine, surrounds its willingness to, to pay short-term economic prices for uh, long-term national security uh, gains. I don't, I don't think we're quite there yet, you know, in the in the in the upcoming German, uh, German China strategy, they talk about uh, making some tweaks to investment guarantees and all of that. But if you look at uh, the recent decision on Costco, uh, Costco's bid for a stake in a terminal at the Hamburg port. Uh, if you look at Schultz's decision to bring a business delegation to China, um, if you look at the outsized role that Huawei still plays in the German 5G network. Um, this suggests that uh, paying a short-term economic price is, is, not, is not something that is uh, acceptable to some people in the government. Um, and, and that, to a certain extent, is understandable. Germany is, is, is suffering some real uh, tough, going through a real tough economic period. I, uh, maybe a final point, I think the rest of Europe 
sees this, uh, it, it, I think it makes it more difficult to, to, to get a European consensus uh, on China, which is difficult in the best of times. Uh, it, it simply increases the risk that everyone is going gonna, is gonna to pursue uh, their own interests. So uh, it's an interesting time in EU-China relations. All the, this flurry of meetings that we've seen over the past few weeks, uh, clearly uh, China is, is engaging with the world again. Uh, and Europe is keen to engage uh, with China. Uh, so, so we're going to have to see how this develops over the, over the course of, of 2023. Great. Thank you, Noah. Liana, what are your thoughts? Thank you, Lily. It's always a humbling experience to follow Noah, who is such a connoisseur of the debate in, in Berlin and Brussels. But I will try to add a few points which perhaps might help to understand a little bit better the debate that we see right now. And I think Noah very rightly pointed to this foreign affairs article of Olaf Scholz. And there are two lines that I find particularly interesting in how he lays out his vision of Zeitenwende and the role that China policy should play there. Because in a sort of in the perception of policymakers, Zeitenwende, this change of an error announcement that Olaf Scholz has given in his speech three days after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, really has escaped the logic of European security by now. I mean, back then it was a speech that was given at a time when Ukraine was considered not to be able to withstand Russia's attack. So it was basically Russia at the gates at this time. It was very much focused on European security. But in the imagination of think tankers, policymakers, it has become this, this shorthand for a big geopolitical awakening of Germany, which obviously should also include China policy. And in this regard, the, the article of Olaf Scholz was certainly a disappointment because what he outlined then his idea of a global Zeitenwende is not global in terms of not only European security, but also China. What he outs, outlines is that um, he does not see a world where the United States is pitched against China. So she, he doesn't want to subscribe to a new Cold War. But he also says that China's rise does not want isolating Beijing or curbing cooperation. At the same time, China's growing power, and I quote here, does not justify claims for hegemony in Asia and beyond. And for someone who is like me, who has worked for a long time on Russia policy, this resembles very much the having the cake and eating it strategy that we've seen with Russia before 2022. So on the one hand, um, criticizing the ambitions of having a sphere of influence in, in the neighborhood, but on the other side saying, well, we still need cooperation and we should not curb cooperation or isolate our, um, our, our partner adversary, however you might call it. And I think it's interesting that the similarity does actually have common roots. So policy towards Russia and China after the end of the Cold War, from a German perspective, was very much based on this German success formula from the end of the Cold War of, of change through trade, the idea that you can achieve some kind of convergence with partners like Russia and China. And the idea of change through trade was certainly abandoned with Russia earlier than it was abandoned with China. But at least some parts of the business community, the big companies in Germany still adhere to this idea, or at least do not see the dangers of interdependence in the same strong way as Germany has come to realize the dangers of inter interdependence um, with Russia. So Germany might be a latecomer in Zeitenwende with Russia, but it is even more so a latecomer with Zeitenwende when it comes when it comes to China. And Perhaps one additional point, um, uh, which also relates to, to China's role in Russia policy, and it's interesting that in the translated documents that you mentioned, Lily, this was made as a point um, by a Chinese analyst that suddenly over the course of this war, European leaders have signed up to seeing China as a player in European, in European security. I think one analyst made the point that sort of the the effects of geographical distance have been weakened. And that's an interesting an interesting dynamic that we see. Um, we also saw that Olaf Scholz praised himself for having um, reduced Russia's nuclear threats. Um, and this is a topic that we see more often, sort of 
the West praising themselves for the success of dealing with India and China and convincing Moscow that it has, reduced, has to reduce its nuclear threats. And I think this might be something of an overestimation, again, of the ability of the West to influence both China and Russia policy. Um, at the moment, such a commitment from China, it's not even a commitment, such a rhetorical statement from China is very much a repetition of, of P5 statements that have been made before, but it will also not, not come cost-free, and it does not mean that China will give up its ambiguity um, towards Russia. Um, so I think, especially in this realm of nuclear policy, where at the moment China was able to position itself as a constructive actor from the perspective of Europeans, we might overestimate the successes that we had with China and overestimate the willingness of China to invest its leverage. So I think it's too early to praise ourselves for the successful diplomacy that we have conducted with China um, on Russia in this case. Thank you, Viana. Uh, I definitely want to dig into the impacts of Chinese-Russian partnerships on uh, European perspectives uh, on China going forward in a little bit, but I want to allow everyone to make their opening statements. So um, I'm hoping we can turn to, to Miko and Mitya now uh, to esteem China scholars uh, among us um, to look at how China is reading some of these issues, uh, especially following the party Congress, the 20th Party Congress, um, and as Xi Jinping emerge, re-emerges on the world stage. Um, Miko, I'm going to start with you. You've written about this idea of fortress China recently. Uh, and signals of that emerging from the 20th Party Congress work report on ideological hardening, uh, strengthening of science and technology, self-sufficiency, um, security above all else. Can you talk a little bit about what this means in the context of China's international behavior going forward um, and particularly its approach to Europe and how it fits into its foreign strategy? Yes, uh, and thanks, Lili, for having uh, me. I'll hand over the difficult part uh, to Mathieu and start with a, a generic assessment of, of um, China's foreign policy course after the 20s Party Congress. And, um, you know, in, in some ways, it's it's quite simple. Right? The, the Party Congress signaled a continuation of Xi Jinping's leadership commitment to existing policies in line with what Liana just said. Um, you shouldn't expect a fundamental change of course with regard to Russia policy, the paranoia confirmed with regard to um, US uh, leadership internationally, the predominance of security as a major concern is not new, but it really tops the agenda now uh, in terms of having its dedicated section in the report, etc. Um, so all of that, I think, um, turns China indeed into a player that has a darkened geopolitical outlook. Um, is feels threatened and um, doesn't see strategic opportunities uh, as prominent as uh, maybe in the past risks and challenges over everywhere and and with that environment within that environment um, Beijing is trying to um, change an international order um, through its own initiatives and in, in that game the European Union and individual member states companies play a dedicated role but a limited role um, i think um, coming out of the party congress you you would not read a dedicated new shift um, in china's europe policy uh, enough to hear what mathieu thinks um, but rather a continuity of trends uh, which is trying to mitigate pressure from the united states a clearer shift towards its own global initiatives, um, the Global South in particular, the region, and then securing good relations moving forward with Europe specifically in terms of technology and economic partnerships, I think is, is, a, is a goal, but um, there's no fundamental new takeaway that I um, was reading into the Party Congress with regard to Europe-China relations. What's clear is I think um, that the, the path for deepened long-term cooperation is narrowing, given the deficit of strategic trust between leaders. But as you've pointed out, Lily, I think rightly so, there's a renewed attempt um, to um, not just stabilize, but invest in the relationship even more than maybe it was the case over the past three to six months. Over to you, Mathieu. Thank you, Mathieu. 
Well, <clears throat> thank you, Migo, for this transition, and uh, and and thanks, uh, Lily and, and Max, for having me. Um, to what you said, Miko, Fortress China um, and, and and everything else, I would say yes, but um, but what if uh, we were seeing the premises of a Chinese charm offensive towards Europe? I think the question really deserves to be asked. Um, not that there is anything substantial coming from China uh, on on the uh, real European interests, such as weaken Chinese support for Russia or market access, but there is a softening of the tone. There is a resumption of leader diplomacy. Um, and I think that this is probably enough to unlock some of the pro-China engagement forces in Europe. And this is happening to some extent. Um, and I would say that of all the things that happened in China in the aftermath of the party Congress uh, from the G20 summit to the loosening of the um, zero COVID measures uh, to the to the demonstrations. Um, what has sent the strongest signal to Europe that uh, way could be possible or a different atmosphere could be possible is the smile in Bali uh, next to Joe Biden. I think that in terms of effects in Europe, this is significant. Um, and I do believe that there is a before and after the Bali encounter when it comes to leader diplomacy. Um, think of the reign of criticism that fell on Olaf Scholz, not in the US, but in European media uh, for during his visit to Beijing. I think the atmosphere is very different now and the French and Italian leaders seem determined to go. So I think there is a unique political momentum for China to try and inject some positive atmosphere in EU-China relations um, from several reasons. But I think the three that deserve attention are there are currently some cracks in the transatlantic united front on the precise issues for which the Trade and Technology Council was created, uh, such as semiconductor and also industrial policy subsidies for green transformation as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, these are decisions that have direct impact on many European corporate interests. So China may see an opportunity there. And the second one is, um, and it was very obvious during uh, Chancellor Scholz's visit to China, uh, the rise of uh, anti-decoupling voices in the political discourse in Europe, which is ironic uh, to some extent, given that what is really happening is not decoupling. And in the material that um, CSIS translated from Chinese sources, uh, it's actually very interesting to read how Chinese experts talk about um, uh, the anti-decoupling forces in Europe. Uh, they really see this as uh, for, for what they are. Um, this, this, we are not talking about decoupling. We are talking about reducing risk. We are talking about addressing vulnerabilities. We are talking about some degree of diversification in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, that's the reality of, uh, let's say, business ties between Europe and, and Asia. Uh, but there is a political narrative about decoupling and anti-decoupling which China can play to its advantage. And then the third factor that um, may create some sort of a momentum, I, I will qualify that after I have finished on that, is the, um, on the one hand, the loosening of the zero COVID restrictions, and on the other hand, the minor adjustments to the Chinese statement on Ukraine, which Liana had already mentioned, um, which taken together, will really nurture or nourish uh, the optimist to believe that a return to engagement may yield positive results for Europe. I am personally very skeptical about those minor language adjustments when it comes to Ukraine. Um, so what would China try to achieve if it was indeed trying to exploit this specific moment in transatlantic relations, but also In China domestically, um, I would argue some damage control, um, neutralizing some of the trends that are detrimental to Chinese interests, um, 
getting the Europeans to lower their guards on some of the issues that uh, really matter for China in terms of access to um, investment opportunities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I would nuance a little bit um, what you rightly said, Miko, uh, as an opening statement. Thank you, Mathieu and Nico. Um, that's great. I, Max, I, I want to turn to you on the transatlantic front, but I'm wondering if I could just follow up with a question for, for Miko and Mathieu to, to begin with, actually to everyone. Um, Mathieu, I thought it was really interesting how you talked about um, what China might seek to get uh, out of uh, what it sees as uh, frictions in the transatlantic relationship. Um, and Miko, I'm wondering, do you have any ideas for what I mean, it's clear some of the Chinese scholars that that uh, we've translated pieces from do see uh, strategic opportunities for China here. Um, one of them, and, and this was translated prior to the, the uh, subsidy disputes, talked about uh, divergence in the Western alliance and how that creates opportunities for China. What are the what would be the goals and, and mechanisms by which China would seek to leverage that um, tension? First of all, I think it's it's um, defensive and to be seen in the broader context of Chinese leaders feeling or at least pretending to feel um, encircled and um, a new network of alliance partnerships being um, created um, that uh, fulfills just one purpose, which is to keep China down. Uh, I, I think that's a deeply rooted um, belief, which um, over the past three to four years, I think, um, was to some extent um, fed with reality because indeed some of these new arrangements have the purpose to deal with China, not necessarily keep it down. I think that's a paranoid part, but um, to align with regard to interests and, um, and policies as much as possible among like-minded countries. So um, the, the European angle plays into that, um, but then it, it's also a and economic reassurance, the European market is incredibly important for China uh, in terms of export opportunities, in terms of um, deep corporate partnerships, um, job creation machines that the European companies are in in China. So, and technology providers. So, I I think that's um, in this um, slow decoupling world that we live in. Um, securing access to European high tech uh, will become even more important um, as we move forward. Um, and finally, it's about legitimacy of China's international posture and um, uh, their capacity to say that um, and to point fingers to Washington um, that not all of the policies that um, uh, U.S. might pursue vis-a-vis -vis China are shared by the rest of the world, so they they're very happy to point out, um, as uh, the European a Chinese ambassador to the EU has already done, that Scholz obviously pursues a different policy um, uh, with regard to block building or the framing of democracy versus autocracy. So they use Europe also, I think, in in that sense, um, to signal that they're not alone uh, and that they are. OECD countries, important industrialized and economies and um, democracies that don't pursue the same strategy as Washington. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the uh, the importance of Europe as a, a market and a source of technology for China. Um, Noah and 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 Miko and Mitu, I'm wondering, uh, do you see a chance for the the EU China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment to to come back, or is that still uh, dead going forward? I, I think we can finally move on from the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment and stop talking about it. Um, uh, I think this wasn't even a, an issue that was raised by uh, Charles Michel. Uh, during his uh, visit to Beijing, and uh, he, he was one of the last defenders uh, of this agreement. Um, we have, there's no easy way out of the, the sanctions uh, impasse, and in a way, I think we've kind of moved uh, beyond this agreement now. We're in a sort of, a, you know, the, if you remember, this was done at the very end of 2020. We're now at the end of 2022. Two years of 
uh, have gone by, and a lot has happened in those in those two years. You know, we've had the uh, uh, the Lithuania case, um, we've had Russia and, and uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and uh, so I, I don't think the uh, I, don't, I don't think the the environment is right for uh, for this uh, for this agreement to be uh, revived at the moment. I'm wondering if we can just move to China, Russia quickly to pick up on a point that Mathieu made. Um, you said that you you asked, and I think it's an open debate here in Washington as well, whether Xi Jinping is emerging from China's COVID lockdowns uh, and and launching a charm offensive um, in the West and perhaps targeted toward Europe. Um, given the reputational damage that China's No Limits partnership with Russia uh, caused for China in Europe, um, is there any chance that she could walk back from this and what would it take? I mean, we've seen him, you know, make uh, statements in opposition to nuclear weapons in, in some of the meetings with European leaders recently. Um, Macron, President Macron of France has recently said that he sees, um, you know, he sees Xi Jinping as critical um, as a mediator in the conflict. Um, perhaps, uh, Mathieu, and then going to Liana, could we, um, could I ask you, uh, you know, what are the chances that this reputational damage could be walked back and what would it take? It's a difficult one. I, I don't believe that the reputational damage can be undone uh, in a short period of time. Um, I think we need to really take the wide view uh, of uh, the whole European continent and not focus only on France and Germany, um, which have very specific approaches to trying to um, convince Xi Jinping to reduce the space in which uh, Russia conducts its war against Ukraine. Um, there is much less enthusiasm for such an approach uh, if you go towards the eastern part of the European continent. And this is where the damage for China's support for the Russian war against Ukraine has been the strongest. Um, and I think that um, yeah, damage done to China's reputation in Poland, the Baltic states, um, several other countries in the East is not going to be easily undone and certainly not uh, through the statement that um, we have read recently. Um, and even the if you read the French version of the encounter, the readout of the encounter between Xi Jinping and Macron. In Bali, uh, there is a mention of France and China being attached to the territorial integrity and the sovereignty of Ukraine, uh, which could sound you know, not bad as at least reducing the space uh, for, for Russia uh, on, the, on the international uh, scene. But um, this, in fact, is read as cosmetic adjustments and uh, and nothing really substantial. Uh, and everyone is watching the the deeds, and everyone is wondering about the flights, for example, uh, that are being spotted uh, on Chinese soil. Um, so I see this as re really something that China is not willing to walk back from. Uh, and despite many attempts, actually, it started at the April EU-China summit, uh, which is in fact a milestone in EU-China relations. Um, never was there any EU-China summit for which the difference of approaches was so strong, and this was really about Ukraine. Uh, the EU wanted to define Ukraine as an issue in EU-China relations uh, and, uh, and the Chinese side had no intention to do so, and hence the and hence the, the the leaders talking past each other. Uh, and I think that um, what we have seen since uh, is just cosmetic adjustments with uh, with no impact. But Liana may disagree with that. I think it's a very sort of this power shift that we see in Europe, that in security policy and everything that sort of relates to NATO and so on, the Central and Eastern Europeans, the Nordics have a much more powerful position than they had in the past compared to the position Germany and France had. I mean, I think that's very much reality. I think it's just yet unclear how that will spill over 
into EU policies and into EU approaches, because in the EU, there are just other languages and mechanisms at hand. I mean, financial power still lies with Germany and France and not with the Central and Eastern Europeans. Um, but I do think these these rifts um, that you outlined, but you, I think they are very present um, and the war has to some extent widened these rifts between those who closely align with the United States and values and security policies. And I still see it and, and, and them Mathieu you might, might correct me, I still see, at least in some of Macron's statement, this idea that we have uh, with the US and with China, two great powers fighting, I think in one speech he said, two elephants fighting, um, implying that uh, Europe should not be the, the trampled uh, grass, uh, to use this quote. Um, and to some extent also, Olaf Scholz's article in Foreign Affairs alludes to that when he says, well, there should not be a return of a new Cold War and that Europe has to find its own independent position in a multipolar world where multiple actors and models of government compete with each other. And I think one can raise many questions. I mean, <laughs> first, what is what does independent Europe mean in that context? And second, do we really live in a multipolar world? Isn't this rather a world where you know one of the key dividing lines will be um, the 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 relationship with China going forward? So I wonder whether there's still this flare of equidistance. <laughs> Let me throw out this this word um, uh, in in some of the views of uh, in the views of some in Germany and France, which is certainly not the case with Central and Eastern Europeans, and then packed together with the IRA and the transatlantic uh, topics that that Max um, knows more about. This reinforces this idea that we have this sort of big fight between the United States and China, and at the same time, the United States benefits from the war and Europeans are sort of coming out of this conflict as the losing side and should therefore not put all their bets on the United States, but keep their relations with China alive and have a third way. So that's sort of the, the, the greater narrative, which I think can can lead to some divides in, in Europe about how, how to assess China. Max, I want to turn to transatlantic relations in a minute and uh, I'll turn over to you, but I wonder if I could just ask one final question on on, on just uh, Europe China relations, because um, one of our readings looks at uh, uh, Central and Eastern European countries and their relationship with China. And this year we've seen um, Latvia and Estonia drop out of the um, well, what used to be 17 plus one now 14 plus one. Um, some of the uh, of the, of the Chinese scholars um, that that the readings uh, are from argue that well this me cooperation mechanism has been of strategic value for China I think we can all recognize that but they acknowledge that um, China may need to boost the value proposition um, uh, to to these countries of that mechanism going forward um, to combat what they what they call the negative impacts of value diplomacy. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, it, perhaps uh, Nico and, and Noah, um, could you um, could you tell us? Do you think that Chinese analysts are reading this right? That greater trade and and investment with those countries um, by China could turn the tide, or because of the geopolitical shifts we've seen over the past year um, and and the reputational damage that really has been the worst in those countries. Um, is that is that door closing? I think it's going to be extremely hard to revitalize this original idea as a uh, regional forum similar to other regional diplomacy initiatives that China has led across the world. And, and um, if you look at governments in, in Prague or Warsaw, I, I think they they have very limited interest in, in being packaged into such an arrangement again. Um, so as a package, I don't think it, it's it's easy to be revitalized. Um, I do believe that, you know, similar to other governments um, and businesses, um, the offer on the table makes a difference. Um, so a country like Hungary or Greece or um, uh, Serbia, um, definitely um, will take incentives as they come along and look at um, 
the commercial, but also the wider political benefits that they can draw from um, close alignment with China. And the extent to which China will be able to form a coalition uh, through their own diplomatic initiatives that then can, again, and that's our fear, obviously, undermine European solidarity and unity. I think we have to be um, careful in underestimating the capacity of China to come back on that. Um, now, I don't think it's a, it's an immediate reality for the next 12 months or so, but this is not dead. It's not a it's not an end game that has been played there. So a, you know, uh, an alternative version of a sub-national, a uh, sub-European um, diplomatic initiative by China that, you know, will fly by another name or through different channels, I think is, is not um, ruled out and will probably play a role as we move forward. Noah, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I, I think we've probably talked too much about 16 plus one and 17 plus one uh, over over the years. Um, China obviously has its 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 close friends in this uh, in this uh, format. Uh, Hungary, Serbia, uh, to a certain extent, uh, Greece. I guess you could put in that category. Um, but the the countries like Poland, uh, Czech Republic. Um, uh, Slovakia, Romania have, have become quite skeptical. So I would agree with Miko that, um, you know, if China comes uh, with some big projects uh, and, and some money, then of course they're, they're going to talk with China. Um, but uh, I'm skeptical uh, about whether uh, about whether that's that's going to happen. It hasn't happened. I mean, if you look at Poland, Poland has a huge trade deficit with China. It's been moving in the wrong direction, not in the right direction. Um, and we had a, a Chinese, the new Chinese uh, envoy to Central and Eastern Europe pass through, uh, passing through the region uh, recently, met, uh, met with uh, officials in Poland and uh, she, she wanted to get things going again, but she really had nothing in her, uh, in her handbag uh, to offer. Uh, so um, I, I'm a bit skeptical about whether this uh, whether this format is can be uh, sort of revived in the way that uh, uh, you know that that it existed uh, when it was when it was formed ten years ago. Uh, I I think it might be dying a sort of a a, a slow a slow death. Um, uh, although, of course, you know, countries like countries like Hungary and Serbia will continue to maintain very close ties with China. And we've seen the big CATL investment in Hungary, um, you know, uh, whether that would have happened with or without uh, a 14 plus one, I, I, I probably would have. Um, so I'll stop there. Great. Um, so we should definitely move on to transatlantic relations now. Uh, Max. Um, at the recent US-EU dialogue on China, um, Stef Stefano Sanino and Wendy Sherman expressed a uh, very strong convergence um, between EU and US perceptions on China and suggested that we're at a place where we can actually start discussing joint action, the specifics of joint action. But there do appear to be some frictions that don't directly relate to China in this relationship that have popped up recently, um, including the EB subsidies in that uh, Inflation Reduction Act as one example, recent US unilateral export controls from the US. Um, what are, sitting in Washington, looking at the transatlantic relationship, what are your assessments of these frictions? And then we can go to our European colleagues. Right. Well, well, first, Lily, let me thank you. It's been great working with you and thank you for, for doing uh, uh, the heavy lifting and moderating this panel and, and organizing. And, and it's great to work with you and be here with everyone else. Um, I, I have a, a, a different take on the Inflation Reduction Act which I think it's actually, we're going to look back and say, this is what saved transatlantic relations. Because I think if you do a counterfactual and say, let's just assume Joe Manchin did not change his mind and come back to the table, uh, and there was no U.S. climate legislation, Republicans take the House, there's no climate legislation in the next two years, and likely for the next decade, because uh, the Senate map in 2024 looks terrible for, for Democrats, and it's going to be a Democratic administration that was going to push 
climate legislation. So Democrats had to control both three branches. This was the once in a decade opportunity. Now imagine if the United States hadn't taken massive climate action, what would US uh, EU relations look like in five years from now? And I think this would have been a major wedge opportunity for China. Uh, I think it's no wonder that, you know, if we look back when China announced its 2060 uh, carbon uh, neutrality goals, it was in the sept September of 2020. Uh, and I think this would have been an area where there would have been rising anti-Americanism for the lack of action on climate uh, in Europe. Uh, China would have been playing sort of the good cop to America's bad cop, especially during potentially uh, Republican administrations. Um, so I, I, I think where we are now is that Europeans are essentially in shock. The United States didn't just take action, but took incredibly strong action, one that is going to be, I think, incredibly transformative. Uh, and I think that, that the only reaction from the EU that will eventually emerge is that the EU will also have to up its game, because I think what will happen is that America, which is not that far behind in Europe and in many of the, the uh, markers of, of the clean energy transition, if you look at uh, expansion of solar and adoption of EVs, all of that's going to be dramatically accelerated and the U.S. is going to really develop a clean energy uh, industry and infrastructure, which European companies are frankly going to benefit from. Uh, but that will mean that there will, is a real need for the U.S. and EU to develop this climate club that has been talked about. And I think to really uh, uh, take the TTC, the Trade and Technology Council, and actually turn it into something real. Uh, we see indications of that with a potential green steel deal between the U.S. and EU, which frankly is about China. It's about the U.S. and EU uh, making their steel cleaner, and Chinese steel is very uh, carbon intensive, which would be mean tariffs against China. Uh, so I think this is going to eventually be uh, a real point of strength in the U.S.-EU relationship, the fact that America is taking climate now incredibly seriously and is acting. Um, but we're, you know, the, Europe is sort of going through bizarre stages of grief because Europe doesn't have a fiscal union, doesn't have a fiscal policy, and, and we do. Uh, and I think there will be need for strong European fiscal action, which is what Macron was really pushing for when he came here uh, in December. So... Uh, I, I think that what we've done is sort of neutralized, I think, climate as an issue that was going to really, uh, uh, right now it looks divisive in the transatlantic lines, but I think it was going to be really a potential wedge uh, in between cooperation between the U.S. and Europe uh, over China. But maybe that's op optimistic. Are other participants as optimistic? Please, Miko. And Liana. Well, look, uh, I appreciate the optimism. I think that's uh, that's important. Um, but I find it a bit of a euphemistic spin, honestly, on, on that. You know, you can do climate policy without necessarily violating WTO rules. I mean, that's at least the interpretation I think that European would, would, Europeans would put forward. I, I think you're right about the, the impetus for um, further um, industrial policy, which will be the result of it. Um, and uh, I'm still somewhat optimistic that with the implementation rules, um, we might resolve at least, you know, maybe the key part, which will be about batteries um, at the end of the day. Um, so that's all good, but um, um, don't underestimate, I think. So stages of grief, I think, is a nice theory here, but, you know, it's it's a math massive bomb uh, and it's not just you know we can we can be happy about um, the, the climate transition being kickstarted now in, in the us absolutely but again you know there's european partners that you either value or don't value so um at this stage i i think it's a massive harm it it, it creates a lot of disunity um and you know if you say europeans just don't get it well then maybe it should have been explained better before um and maybe there could have been bridges to, to avoid avoid these frictions that have now emerged, um, and they are serious, right? And it's not just the French. Um, so the walkout by Thierry Breton, I, um, as a European Commissioner, I think um, is is important uh, from TTC. But it's there's a lot of um, discontent across government officials. Um, companies are less worried about it because they will benefit from the subsidies, partly at least. Um, so that's. That's an interesting dynamic that we should recognize. But I think we're making it too easy to just say, um, uh, deal with it, 
and it's a better deal that you get now. Maybe I can just add one word. Uh, I think it, it's not happening in a vacuum, right? Uh, it's happening at a time when uh, the European economy is really suffering and uh, companies here in Germany are going public with plans to, to, to reduce investment here. I think a lot of energy intensive companies in Germany are uh, are really struggling uh, you know, uh, Mittelstand companies on the brink of bankruptcy, that kind of thing. So, uh, so it's another, it's, it's sort of the, 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 the drop that led the, uh, the bucket to overflow. I'm, I'm talking in German now, but, um, uh, but yes, yes. So, so it, I think, I think it's not just the IRA that is, that is, uh, is triggering this, this, uh, this huge uh, backlash in Europe. Liana, I know you had comments. Yeah. No, and the Max perspective because I myself have been quite critical of Macron's framing when he was here in DC and I feel a little bit between two stools here about saying this risks a fragmentation of the West of the West which I think is against the backdrop of a war in Europe which basically the United States is the only reason that Ukraine or the main reason that Ukraine is still there and that is providing leadership here in this war I think Macron's drama was a bit too much and I think it was a bit too much also for Germans who really didn't want to see a trade war with the United States. They want to fix it um, and not to, you know, uh, get into serious transatlantic trouble. Um, and I, I think the most important aspect here probably is that the IAA was never intended sort of uh, intentionally against Europeans, right? I mean, I think Europeans were just, and you correct me, Max, I think Europeans were just overlooked. <laughs> it was a policy process where at some point uh, someone woke up and was like, oh, have we asked what this means for Europeans? And then suddenly it all blew up, but it was never meant and it was probably um, just overlooked in the process. It was never meant as a side as a problem for for Europeans and I think Biden's statements made this quite clear so I think this should be a drama episode that we should get behind uh, us and, and move on. Yana, does it yeah, make it better or worse if it was not meant that way? I'm not sure. <laughs> no, exactly. By the way, it's like, it's like in a relationship so. if you mean it or if you don't mean it. Right. <laughs> we saw the same with AUKUS, right? <laughs> Exactly. The fact that the Europeans are often collateral damage is a problem in itself. But I would still share um, to, to um, I think Max optimism um, will only materialize if the Europeans are able to come up with an ambitious set of industrial policies. That's the only scenario that is positive for Europe and uh, we are not there yet. I think the uh, EU Chips Act has been uh, the first European attempt to relax uh, European rules on competition policy that are extremely strict. Uh, what we have for EV is support for innovation. It's not support for manufacturing. So there is an immediate risk uh, to the automotive sector in Europe, uh, which also has an impact on the integration between the European automotive sectors and the Chinese automotive sector. Uh, so there is a triangulation here that, that works. Um, the European Commission has a set budget until 2027. It's extremely difficult to come up with a package of state aid. Uh, there is no, there is not the flexibility that the, that the US uh, federal government has. Um, I think that overall, what makes me optimist, maybe against all odds, is the fact that this is the direction in which Europe is going anyway, uh, resuming um, you know, an industrial, an approach to industrial policy. Um, but there are many obstacles before we get there. Maybe the second point I would make is that this after the October 7 rules on semiconductors, um, which also, you know, come with collateral damage on uh, Dutch interest and, and the other European countries that have a semiconductor industry. And very interestingly, despite all the consultations that are going on between the Europeans and the US uh, on nanoelectronics. So sometimes the US just um, speeds up uh, and uh, and everyone has to adjust uh, and and pick up the broken pieces. But what is at stake currently between the between the US and the Netherlands is really a very, very interesting test of uh, 
you know, converging uh, after a major unilateral decision was taken. Max, what are your thoughts? <laughs> are you so, are you convinced? No, so I, I look, I totally get where Europeans are coming from. Uh, you know, they're having to decouple from Russian energy. They're they're having uh, tremendous inflation that isn't caused by uh, by you know inflationary checks, uh, but by uh, decoupling. Uh, and that you know, while <laughs> I think it is, I think it is important that this wasn't intentional. Uh, to uh, uh, to keep Europe out of the subsidies. Uh, I think, you know, who knew that we didn't have a free trade agreement with the EU? My guess is not a lot of Senate staffers did. Uh, and the way we do legislation is is not is kind of an embarrassment. Uh, and that's all true. Uh, but uh, this is ultimately about China. Uh, and there was a choice of whether the United States was just going to basically uh, ship government subsidies out to build up a Chinese uh, clean energy in, uh, industry uh, in order to accelerate the transition or not. And I do think that, you know, the complaints about the WTO rules, well, there are questions about CBAM being WTO compliant. Uh, and the WTO was created pre-concerns about climate change. And I think in order to really accelerate the transition, something like this is going to be needed in Europe. And Europe was hitting the bounds of what was possible. You know, you're not going to shift if you're a household, uh, your gas fired, gas boiled uh, uh, radiator for a heat pump unless someone's giving you incentives uh, or you're increasing prices, which is not going to be possible in the current European environment. So to me right now, we need to use this moment, this current anger. Europeans need to reassess where they are and hopefully we can use that to elevate the ambition of the TTC of US EU uh, economic and climate cooperation. And I hope it instigates that. It might not. It might lead to just years of um, of complaints and, and going EU going to the WTO. But uh, so that would be bad. But I think I still think the alternative of the US not doing anything on climate would ultimately be worse for U transatlantic relations and our and uh, working together on China. Well, that's a very optimistic uh, way to conclude, and we have a few minutes left. I just wanted to um, to to ask our panelists uh, very quickly what I, what are your just looking at the year ahead? Um, you know the 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 U.S. EU tensions that we're seeing right now. What are your anticipations about the duration of those, the scope of those, um, and the extent to which they will? Um, they will harm um, a greater unity of purpose when it comes to to China policy and joint action that has been called for on on both sides, at least on a theoretical level. Um, so let's uh, I'll just I'll, I'll go to Mathieu and then uh, Miko, Noah and then Liana and Max. I still there is still I think there is still strong transatlantic convergence and a defensive agenda vis-a-vis -vis China and we, sh we should work on that uh, and for the Europeans it means completing and finishing our, tool, our toolbox of defensive measures, um, dealing with the easy issue first. I mean, we need with the US to manage differences on export control. Uh, within Europe, we need to show coherence when it comes to screening investment and, and, and addressing investment that comes with um, excessive leverage or inappropriate access to technology. The rules are there, but um, then, then there needs to be good enforcement. Um, we need to be credible and anti-coercion, and, and this is also a transatlantic agenda. This is primarily currently an intra-European agenda, but uh, we will need to show credibility. Um, and, and there is also some, some space with the US uh, to build a normative data space uh, that allows trustworthy exchanges. So I think this whole defensive agenda vis-a-vis -vis China is still quite promising to me. Thank you, Mika. I, I fundamentally agree. I think there's the overarching trend is still convergence. There's um, bombs have been dropped um, on on the desks, um, but um, um, we'll clean up and, and move on. I think um, China will probably make it easier um, to for us to converge further. I mean, that's my baseline assessment. In many ways, I, I don't see China converging or being successful with its charm offensive in the next six to 12 months to an extent that it would fundamentally derail 
the overarching trend towards more like-minded coordination. Maybe let's include others in that picture. I find that very important. And then there's a lot of parallelism that will be constructive, I think. I mean, the investment in of Europe, Europe and the United States into the deepening of the partnership with India, for instance, is a very important trend. Um, the same probably goes um, for Japan, Australia. All of that, I think, will put us overall on a an aligned trajectory. Hopefully, there will not be too many um, frictions along the way. I think the next few weeks and months will be quite critical for both the export control and and the um, subsidies question. So it's a critical moment, but not one that will fundamentally derail, I think, the overarching trend. What is there left to say? Um, I, I do think we can overcome the the current divisions in the transatlantic relationship. I mean, the next few weeks will be will be quite interesting to watch. We had a major row over over Afghanistan. We had a major row over AUKUS. We we over overcame these, uh, and I think the U.S. and Europe have a, have a strong interest in in working together. And you can see that in Schultz's uh, foreign affairs article, even though. I think, from a U.S. perspective, they they would have would have liked to probably see uh, see more uh, different language on 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 China. Uh, what what I'm I mean, I do think Europe and Europe and the U.S. are are more united now vis-a-vis uh, -vis China than they have been, uh, you know, ever perhaps. Uh, certainly in the last five years, uh, but I think what we're going to see increasingly going forward is what, what I would uh, call a sort of urgency gap. Uh, we're seeing the U.S. Uh, government uh, take measures like export controls. I think we're going to probably see an executive order on outbound investment screening in the first first quarter of next year. Um, I think we'll probably see the U.S. looking at Europe uh, uh, on 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 a bit more closely on 5G again, returning to this issue, given the the lack of progress in in some large uh, European uh, German speaking countries. Um, so uh, I think uh, this this sort of urgency gap um, is is going to be an issue. The U.S. wants to move fast. It is worried about national security. Uh, Europe has this defensive agenda, but if you look at what uh, what individual countries are doing, I think it's 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 not uh, it's it's not uh, seen in, in in Washington as moving fast enough. Yeah, I can also conclude on an optimistic uh, note. I think the transatlantic alliance had never been stronger. I mean, I think the war in Ukraine really brought Europe and the United States together in a way that they haven't been for a really long time. And I think the crucial point about transatlantic unity or disunity will not be China, but in the next year will be Ukraine and the question of an endgame in Ukraine. So what kind of endgame do we want to see in Ukraine? Is it the February lines, the pre-invasion lines? Is it a negotiated agreement? Is it Ukraine retaking all of its territory? Um, I think that's going to be a, a big question in, in the next year. And then if China offers itself and tries to continue, as what you put it, the, the, the charm offensive, and offers itself as a kind of constructive mediator in, in this war, or at least pretends to do so, um, that might also have an influence on uh, Europeans' thinking. Um, but I think for the moment, it's really the war in Ukraine, which is uh, of the first order priority for Europeans in the next year. Thank you, Liana, for ending on that optimistic note. Um, and I just really want to thank all our panelists here for a very rich and thought provoking discussion and reflection on the dynamics of the EU, China, US relationship across the past year and uh, prognoses for the year forward. Um, I, I want to thank our audience for tuning in. Uh, my co-host Max has had to run to another event he's running um, online on the broader transatlantic security implications of greater Sino-Russian military alignment. So if you're looking to continue this conversation, please just head right over to that event. Um, and um, I, I, I want to plug the Interpret Project uh, one more time. We are always looking for
interesting, thought provoking articles uh, from Chinese scholars and policymakers to translate. So please send us your suggestions. Uh, thank you again to our panelists uh, and and everyone uh, for for joining us this afternoon, this evening. Um, there is uh, a lot to watch for in the year ahead in this relationship, and uh, we hope to have another event perhaps in six months to reflect on whether some of the prognoses have have come to fruition or not. So thank you. Mm -hmm.